Howdy y'all, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. Are you ready to look at some incredible photographs of some breathtaking architecture of the old world? Truly immense structures, what some would call a star fort city, but what could be best described as an entire fortified island, the capital city of Malta, Valletta. This magnificent island often goes off the radar of many historians and those who research the old world, Valletta being the southernmost capital city in all of Europe. With the recent research of the likes of Paul Cook, we have had the luxury of being able to identify and get up close and personal with these ancient structures in a much more accessible way. To help aid fellow researchers on the journey into the history of Valletta, I have assembled for you today the oldest, rarest, and most detailed historic photographs of Valletta dating from the mid to late 1800s through the beginning of the 20th century. To accompany these images, we will also dive into the currently accepted narrative, albeit take this history with a grain of salt. Valletta is not only the southernmost capital city in Europe, but it is actually the smallest capital city by area in the European Union, sitting at just under one-fourth of a square mile. However, the habitable or functional urban area of Valletta is considered to be the entire island, which is home to over 480,000 people. While the history is fashioned in a way for us to easily digest it, I again ask you to be mindful of the details that are given here, which become more and more questionable as new research and new excavations are being conducted throughout this island. According to legend, Mount Siberis is a sort of mythical or ancient hill in present-day Valletta. The name Siberis is attested to in the oldest written histories of Malta and claimed to derive from the first families to call Valletta home. Interestingly, the Siberis Peninsula, as it's known today, of which Valletta is at the apex, actually derives its name from Mount Siberis, meaning the peninsula was named after the mountain or hill. That being said, it is now believed that Sibetis is actually a Phoenician or Canaanite word, meaning either headland or middle peninsula. The history of this land then appears to go dormant or fast forward to the 16th century. According to a creed upon history, most scholars say the Sibetis Peninsula by the year 1500 was almost entirely barren of structures and people besides a rather daunting and sophisticated old world lighthouse dedicated to St. Elmo, the patron saint of sailors, and the infamous St. Elmo's fire. This elaborate lighthouse was said to have been constructed in roughly 1488. However, the origins of the architects are much more debatable. The foundations of the lighthouse, and indeed the history as it's told to us by the Order of St. John, describes the original lighthouse structure as Aragonite, However, for me, the question becomes, if this Order of St. John, who is telling us the history that we have today, if they witnessed the strength or the importance of this lighthouse of St. Elbo, and if this Aragonite lighthouse had any additional surrounding structures, or possibly even a much earlier history, we are not told about it, as in the year 1552, the Aragonite lighthouse of St. Elmo was demolished completely by the Order of St. John. On top of the ruins of this lighthouse was constructed then one of the finest and earliest examples of star forts in Europe. This star fort still stands today, at least partially, and is known as Fort St. Elmo. It's hard to say with exact certainty what architectural or defensive aspects the original 16th century Order of Malta Star Fort Incorporated, but needless to say, Fort St. Elmo almost immediately in history comes into play after centuries of this entire landscape said to be remaining relatively dormant. In 1565, during the Great Siege of Malta, Fort St. Elmo was briefly captured by Ottoman forces, before then being retaken by the Knights of Malta, which had formed from the earlier Order of St. John. This Order of St. John, alongside their Sicilian companions, would go on to retake Fort St. Elmo 
and Valletta, and then the entire country of Malta. The knights and this siege became one of the most well-known sieges of the time, and to say this was world famous would be an understatement. The philosopher Voltaire is stated as saying, and I quote, nothing is better known in the world than the siege of Malta, end quote. So my question would then become, what exactly occurred? Not in the siege or the battle itself, but instead, what occurred in the historical narrative? What shifted the attention and the knowledge away from Malta and from Valletta? We're told everyone in Europe for the most part, whether rich or poor, in the 16th century, was familiar with Valletta, was familiar with Malta, knew what a star fort was, and knew about the siege so I must ponder and I must wonder at what point in history did Valletta, did Malta seem to lose the wide scale attention that it once received. Jean de Valette was the 49th, yes I said 49th, Grand Master of the Order of Malta from 1557 through 1568. As Grand Master, Vallette became the Order's hero and the most illustrious leader, commanding the resistance against the Ottomans, sometimes regarded as one of the greatest sieges of all time. After the siege, Vallette decided to fortify the entire island, which would go on to take his name and become known as Valletta. The Grand Master Vallette asked nearly every European king and prince for help, sending his knights, now world famous, to gather funds. Vallette and the Order of Malta received a lot of assistance due to the inescapable fame that the Order had received after their victory in the Great Siege. Again, the narrative makes it out to seem like every living person in the 16th century would have been well aware of star forts and the epic architecture of Valletta. The cornerstone to fortify Valletta was laid by de Valette in March of 1566, to much fanfare. Reports claim that the elders of Malta spoke after the cornerstone was laid, claiming, and I quote, There will come a time when every piece of land on the Siberus Hill will be worth its weight in gold, end quote. The city of Valletta was said to be designed entirely by two men, Francesco La Pirelli, the assistant to Michelangelo, and Girolamo Cesar, a Maltese military engineer. Grand Masters of the Order quickly moved to the completed city by the early 1570s. Then, in 1634, roughly 60 years after the completion of the fortified city of Valletta, the Knights' official powder factory exploded, which was situated right next to the slave's prison, damaging part of the Wignacourt Aqueduct, said to be the first aqueduct in the city to supply the buildings with running water. This explosion was responsible for leveling a good amount of the lower portion of the city. Slaves' prison, which held upwards of 900 slaves, would again become quintessential when in 1749, Moorish, Hungarian, Georgian, and even Maltese-born slaves revolted. By the mid-18th century, the Order of Malta housed over 9,000 slaves in Malta, allowing freedom of assembly and religion, but not freedom to choose housing or even to interact with European-born members of society. These rules or laws were often ignored, and the population of Malta's working class was said to be an amalgamation of many different backgrounds. However, when Manuel Pinto de Fonseca Grand Master of the Order of Malta attempted to harshly enforce these and other bigoted policies. The disenfranchised people of Malta planned a revolt. However, an unknown person or persons leaked this information to the Knights of Malta. Large portions of the Moorish, Hungarian, and Georgian-born people in Malta were then gathered up and lost their lives. Just 26 years later, it was the clergy the same European-centric religious leaders who supported the Order of St. John against the slaves in 1749, who would come under the wrath of the Order. In what became known as the Rising of the Priests, the clergy attempted to retake Malta from the Order of St. John, succeeding in capturing Valletta. 
However, the entire operation was quelled by the Order of St. John, who quickly retook and began rebuilding parts of the island. Now here is where the history becomes especially convoluted in a sort of why is this here way. Napoleon Bonaparte and the French were said to have landed in Valletta, Malta on June 9th, 1798, quickly expelling the Order of St. John. The French abolished nobility, abolished the feudal system, abolished slavery, and also did away with the ongoing inquisition in Malta. The French were also said to have defaced or removed the Order of St. John insignia from nearly every building on the island. While we're told, and it seems the French were, working to liberate the people of Malta, we're told again by September of 1798, the Maltese people, not the Knights or the Order of St. John, but the Maltese people themselves rebelled against the French. We're told the French, who did away with the harsh and strict Roman Catholic Church in Malta, were apparently almost instantaneously pushed out of Malta by the Maltese people. We're told these Maltese citizens preferred the tyrannical rule of the Order of St. John as opposed to the liberation of the French and Napoleon. Something tells me there's a little more to this than what we're told in the narrative. This Maltese rebellion, literally citizens, were mobilized and they somehow pushed the entire French army, which mind you, had just defeated the entire Knights of Malta. These citizens pushed the French army back into the city of Valletta and completely out of the rest of Malta. Here, we're told in Valletta, the French were forced to remain for over two years, blockaded by almost every angle. We're told the star city of Valletta, however, was impossible for the Maltese people to penetrate. Therefore, the French were basically safeguarded from attacks. It wasn't until the Maltese reached out to the British that Valletta was finally captured and the French forces surrendered on September the 5th of 1800, making Malta a British protectorate. As you can see, as we dive into this history, there's obviously a lot that happened here. There's a lot that was convoluted. There's a lot in this discussion that it seems that was really brushed over, made so we don't dive into it more, made to be acceptable, but not to the point that we have the real details we need to understand this history. And it remains convoluted. In the early 1800s, for example, right after the British took over this island, we're told the British ordered the complete destruction of Valletta to be carried out by the British civil commissioner, Henry Pagat. However, we're also told that he failed to complete any of his duties. Then again, in 1860 and in 1870, in both years, it was agreed upon by the British forces in Valletta that the Star City was to be torn down, destroyed completely, and rebuilt. Again, however, we're told it was never carried out, and the 16th century fortifications have survived to this day largely intact. So, we move forward in the history. By 1939, Valletta was said to be abandoned completely by the Royal Navy. However, World War II would outbreak just a couple months later, so Valletta's strategic importance again came to the forefront. Winston Churchill referred to the island as a, quote, unsinkable aircraft carrier, end quote. And Erwin Rommel of the Axis powers claimed, and I quote, without Malta, the Axis will end by losing control of North Africa, end quote. This all then commenced in the 1940 and 1941 Siege of Malta, in which over 2,000 Italian and German aircraft, as well as over 700 Allied aircraft, were said to have fought in the skies above Malta, leaving Valletta a dilapidated wasteland. The Grand Harbor of Valletta, for example, was hit by nearly 10,000 unique airstrikes in just over two years. However, by the early 21st century, Valletta has again become a skyrocketing area of European culture. Having been heavily rebuilt and renovated since World War II, 
while still maintaining pieces of the original infrastructure of Valletta, which are over 400, sometimes 500 years old. In the year 2018, Valletta was named the European Capital of Culture for that year. And folks, that is about where I'm going to wrap up this video now that we've come to modern times. Obviously, the narrative here, really no amount of history written, can do justice to the immense and miraculous structures which we have looked at in today's video. All of these structures which once lined the streets of Valletta, making it even more imposing that this architecture, in parts, may have been rebuilt, renovated, or not original. But what lies beneath the renovations? What sits below the streets? What is within the infrastructure of Valletta? Would we find Maltese ruins, Phoenician? And could this magnificent city of Valletta, often credited as being the site to an important lighthouse of St. Elmo, could this city of Valletta actually be the metaphorical fire which could help spark us in this convoluted history of Europe? The photographs today may help hold the answers. But I wanted to share them with you in a context that you would be able to dive into them and also hear a little bit of the history as well. So for the remainder of this video, we'll continue looking at the oldest, the rarest, and the hidden photographs of Valletta. Hopefully, these images have lit the fire in your proverbial mind's eye and have sparked your interest to take a deeper dive into this research. I thank you all again for joining me. If you enjoyed today's video, please like the video, share the video if you want to help my channel grow, and if you'd like to get in touch with me or reach out to me in a more personal way, you can always do that as well. I look forward to hearing from you. The history of Valletta is one I was proud and excited to share with you today, and I can't wait to talk to you on the next video.